So I'm Marcia Inhorn. I'm a professor of anthropology, like Dr. Catherine Panterbrick, my good colleague here. Um, we're both medical anthropologists, and I have basically spent my career um, working in the Middle East. And so I'm going to take you to the Middle East, but then I'm going to bring you back from the Middle East to the Arab American world and talk about Arab refugees who've been resettled and have been here for a while and some of the challenges they face. And um, Hani Mawafi is not in the room that I see, but I appreciate his coming before me and talking about Aleppo, Syria. I am wearing a silk scarf made in Aleppo, Syria in a silk company that is no longer in existence. And I just want to say that Syria was one of the most beautiful countries in the world and much of it has been destroyed. Um, and I just want to speak to Syria and the beauty that was Syria. Okay, um, I have a book coming out this fall from Stanford University Press called Air America's Arab Refugees, Vulnerability and Health on the Margins. And I'm gonna give you pieces of that book, you know, sort of pieces from it. And my talk is gonna be very political because I wanna talk about responsibility for conflict. You know, who bears that responsibility? How do we get to the place where we've gotten in parts of the Middle East? And I'm focusing particularly on Iraq today. But let's just begin with the world at war. There are about 55 violent conflicts, 13 are recent, started since 2011, and four of them are high casualty conflicts with more than 10,000 deaths occurring annually in both 2014 and 2015. And unfortunately, three of these high fatality wars are in the Middle Eastern region, in the Middle East and North Africa, Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria. We hear a lot about Syrian refugees um, and we sort of are focusing on Syria, but Afghanistan and Iraq continue to be plagued by very severe violence, and many of the refugees in Europe are Afghan or Iraqi, not just Syrian. I want to point that out. And my point here, two of these wars were authorized by the U.S. Congress in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, 2011 was a critical moment in that President Barack Obama said that the war in Iraq was over. On December 18th, 2011, presumably all the US ground troops were removed from the country of Iraq. But that was the same year, 2011, which was the beginning of the so-called Arab Spring. All the protest movements had started. And in the aftermath, we know that we can't really call it an Arab Spring. It was a moment of insurgency and protest. It has started out hopefully and aspirationally, and it's ended up in some very bad outcomes with the initiation of three new Middle Eastern wars in Syria, Libya, Yemen, and ultimately I'm gonna to talk to you about the emergence of ISIS. Foreign Policy Magazine in 2015, so two years ago, said that there are 10 wars to watch in the world today, and four of them, including some of the most important, are in the Middle East. The list includes this combined war, this sort of merged war between Syria, Iraq, and the Islamic State, which is sort of between those two countries, and this is what they called the top war in the world today. Afghanistan, Dr. Panterbrook and Mark Eggerman have worked in Afghanistan, but the Afghan war is now 16, 17 years old. Many commentators are calling it a permanent war. It probably is a war that will never go away. Yemen, the forgotten war, um, Saudi Arabia and its Gulf coalition, including the US, because we are military allies of Saudi Arabia, we are bombing the heck out of Yemen. There is a Gulf war going on that we don't hear much about, but it's a major humanitarian crisis. And Libya, Muammar Gaddafi was removed, but there is a civil war going on in Libya that's involving parts of the Saharan region. So these are four top 10 wars in the world today. I'm going to talk mostly about Iraq and what I call the ongoing Iraq war. I should really say it's more like 37 years of suffering um, because it really dates back to 1980 or 1979. The Ba'ath Party was a social democratic party that came into power in Iraq and Saddam Hussein became the leader of the Ba'ath Party in 1979. He was a warmonger for sure. A year after his election or his becoming president, he plunged Iraq into a very long, almost decade long war with Iran, which is considered to be one of the longest conventional wars between two countries in modern history with up to a million people killed. It ended in 88. Two years later, he invaded the neighboring country of Kuwait, beginning the first Gulf War. It was only a six week war, 
But the UN sanctions period that followed lasted for 13 years where Iraq was sanctioned and people could not import things into that country, including food, medicine, and basic supplies. It was very difficult for Iraq. Um, right after America left Kuwait and Iraq, the U.S. backed a failed Shia insurgency. The Shia Muslims from southern Iraq were asked to rise up in an intifada against Saddam Hussein. They did, but they failed. And by 1992, we see the first wave of Iraqi refugees fleeing through Saudi Arabia, where they often ended up in refugee camps under horrible conditions for five, six, seven years. About 80,000 Iraqis came in that first wave. In 1996, the UN, realizing the Iraqi citizens were suffering, started an oil for food program. We give you food, Iraq, you give us your oil. And then September 11th happened, and you know, Iraq was blamed, Saddam Hussein was blamed by George W. Bush. And so after invading Afghanistan in 2001, the U.S. started its operation in Iraq called Operation Iraqi Freedom, the so-called second Gulf War. In 20, 2006, Saddam Hussein was executed. But things were so unstable in Iraq that there was a so-called U.S. troop surge to try to sort of make things a little calmer, to reduce the casualties, the heavy casualties. And by this time, there were so many Iraqis trying to flee the country that U.S. Ambassador Ryan Crocker urged President George W. Bush to start admitting Iraqi refugees back to the U.S., especially those who had helped U.S. forces as translators, guides, drivers, and so on. And so in this period, beginning in 2007, we see the second major wave of Iraqi refugees coming into the country. Um, and it's been ongoing. I'm going to show you the figures. And presumably, things ended. The war was supposed to be over in 2011. The U.S. completed its troop withdrawal. But two years later, something called ISIS emerged, in declaring itself an Islamic state. In 2014, ISIS took over Mosul, the second largest city in Iraq. By 2015, the Iraqi army realized it needed to do something to sort of challenge ISIS in Iraq. And so with U.S. support, the Iraqi army launched its offensive to take back these key cities. By 2016, there was really a full-scale war going on with ISIS, and it involved U.S. military support. There are estimated to be at least 5,000 U.S. troops on the ground in Iraq, and the effort to take back Mosul continues right now as I speak. So it is 2017, is what, April 13th, 2017, the U.S. war in Iraq has not ended. Okay, so it started in 2003, it's 2017, which makes it a 14-year war, and God only knows how long it will continue. Why, why did George W. Bush intervene in Iraq? Well, purportedly, it was to find and destroy the weapons of mass destruction. We know this was based on false intelligence, on a lie that somehow Saddam Hussein was responsible for September 11th. Um, and so it was supposedly to increase U.S. security. Definitely it was to overthrow Saddam Hussein, who he was a bad guy. Everybody realizes he was a very brutal dictator. It was better that he be taken out, if you will. But there were other neoconservative interests at play, including the notion of regime change, if you could sort of create an Iraq that would be friendly to US interests, especially the oil fields. We would have more oil flowing out of Iraq. And purportedly, this was about democracy building, to establish a democratic regime in Iraq, and also to be less of a threat to Israel. So these were there were all sorts of, of reasons why the US wanted to invade Iraq in 2003. But the outcome has been bleak. The, this war in Iraq has been condemned by most political scientists, and I am not a political scientist, but um, I've read the political science sort of analyses. They say it's probably the worst military intervention in recent history, in recent American military history. It was a foreign policy failure. George W. Bush, when he went to war in Iraq, did not know the difference between a Sunni and Shia Muslim. He admitted it. He didn't know that there were sort of different branches of Islam, and he didn't know what he was doing. The U.S. threw its weight behind the Shia and Kurdish populations of Iraq. They're minority populations in the world of, you know, sort of the Middle Eastern world. And it was the first time 
in modern Middle Eastern history where Shia Muslims, who are the minority sect of Islam, were given power and control in an Arab country. And so we sort of put our support behind the Shias at sort of the expense of the Sunnis, which is where um, Saddam Hussein came from. And this has just unleashed, it's unseated incredible sectarian tension and rivalry, not only in Iraq, but in Syria and in other parts of the Middle East. It's led to widespread political instability, a democracy has not been installed in Iraq. It's a very weak and incomplete democracy. And the US war, we can say, was really, in a way, seeded the growth of Islamic jihadist groups in the country. The US, because it created this very unstable, chaotic situation in Iraq, really it became a breeding ground for groups like Al-Qaeda, Nusra Front, ISIS and so on. So we have to really look at ourselves and say, we did a lot of this. The US government is responsible for a lot of the bad things that have happened in Iraq. Did anybody hear George W. Bush on NPR this morning? Driving in? Oh, yes. What did he say? Oh, he didn't admit that there was any problem. No regrets, no remorse. Um, what he's done in his post-presidency is to become a great painter, a great oil painter. And he has just issued a book of paintings of Iraq and Afghan veterans, American veterans who've been wounded and so forth. And that's where he's put his effort. He has not been tried for war crimes. He feels no guilt. He thinks it was a good thing that happened, as do many of the people from his regime. So basically, it was, you know, we haven't re taken responsibility for what we un unleashed in Iraq. And I feel that if you break something, you have to fix it, and you have to take responsibility for the people whose lives you disrupted. And so I'm going to be talking about that. In my book, I talk about all the costs of war for Iraqis. A horrible toll. The body count is very high. Some people estimate that about a half million Iraqis have died. Mental health costs we heard about this morning, high rates of PTSD, anxiety, depression, and so on. There have been high maternal and child health costs because infrastructure has been destroyed. And, you know, we talked about, Henny, you talked about medical targeting. Absolutely happened in Iraq. The destruction of clinics, hospitals, the fleeing of Iraqi healthcare personnel. That's a story that's been documented. Horrible environmental health costs in Iraq. There is a radioactive substance called depleted uranium, DU. It's been used extensively by the U.S. military forces in both of the wars in Iraq, and it has got a very long 4.5 billion um, year half-life. It is basically re radioactive uranium has been just, you know, dumped in the environment, and so we're beginning to see high rates of cancer, congenital birth defects in children, and I'm going to talk probably about some of the reproductive health effects of DU. But today, for the rest of the time, I want to talk about the Iraqi refugee crisis. And that's really what my book, um, you know, it, we go from war, you know, why, what happened, why did people feel that they need to flee, and where did they end up? There have been, between the years 2007, when finally the U.S. said, okay, we need to start taking in Iraqis again, there have been the total, oh, I can point, the total is this number. About 125,000 Iraqis have entered um, the U.S about half of those who would like to be admitted as refugees into the U.S. Um, and you can see that the numbers have absolutely increased. Began very small, 1,000. And did you know that, like last year, the number of Syrian refugees ad admitted, I think in 2015, was about that amount, a very, very tiny number of Syrian refugees led into this country. So it started very small, then there was a huge sort of spike, got bigger, 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 and back, you know, bigger here, but sort of a decline, and, and we don't know what's going to happen because of our new regime of President Trump. Um, it, you know, where did they go? The levels of resettlement, they talk about sort of resettlement levels. I am going to be talking, oops, sorry, I am going to be talking about <coughs> Michigan in red. Michigan, a poor state overall, has taken in its fair share, as have California and Texas, two big states, Tiny Connecticut is a good state to be a refugee, by the way, but because it's just a small state, we're a small state, the numbers have been small, sort of less than 1,000. But, you know, the whole country, 49 of the 50 states have taken in Iraqi refugees. One state, which was the big blank white space on the map this morning that was shown, did anybody notice that? Yeah. Which state is that? Mark, you're going, 
It's the state of Wyoming. Dick Cheney's state has taken zero Iraqi refugees. And in fact, apparently no refugees at all because it's a blank on the refugee map. So there you go, Dick Cheney. Remember, he was an architect of this whole problem. <laughs> Okay, well, I want to take you to Michigan. Um, I was a professor at University of Michigan before I came to Yale, and I worked for five years in uh, the Iraqi and the sort of population of this place, which is called Arab Detroit, by scholars Nabil Abraham and Andrew Shryack. They have published huge, thick, edited volumes called Arab Detroit, republished in 2011. But I find this to be interesting. This is probably a Yemeni woman wearing both the hijab and niqab, or full facial veil, but she's behind an American car. <laughs> because why? A Michigan, Detroit, Michigan is Motor City. There has been a robust auto industry there over the years. And a lot of the first Arabs who came to Detroit came there actually long ago in the early 1900s to work in Henry Ford's automobile factory. So that was sort of the beginning of the Arab community there. Um, and the Ford Rouge factory, which is Ford's largest auto factory in the world, literally is right there in the heart of Dearborn, which is sort of the center of Arab Detroit. It's polluting. The smokestacks are often billowing. And literally, every time I would drive in, I would just go by the Rouge plant. And then uh, a mile away was the clinic in which I worked. So it's a sort of polluted industrial kind of landscape there. Still, it is an enclave that really serves a large Arab community. The highest estimates that are about 400,000 Arabs living in Arab Detroit. There are Arab businesses. There's a vibrant religious community. And this is actually the largest mosque in America, which happens to be a Shia Muslim-dominated mosque, because Shia Muslims, who are the minority in the Middle East, are the majority in Arab Detroit, because they've had to flee often as minority Muslims out of the region. And so Arab Detroit is North America's largest Arab ethnic enclave. And so being in an enclave community can be comforting when you're a refugee. We've heard about refugee networks of support and why that's important to be around your community. And, and that's really what Detroit offers on some levels. But it has real problems on the other hand. Detroit is America's poorest big city. It has extremely high poverty rates for a city, a metropolitan area, over 200,000 people. Detroit itself, and I'm going to show you the map, the center of Detroit is predominantly African American. Um, it ranked first for poverty. More than a third of all Detroit citizens are impoverished, living below the federal poverty line. And overall, two-thirds of Detroiters live either in poverty or in a state of Alice asset limited, income constrained, though employed. They are the working poor. They may have some part-time jobs, they may be working, but they are poor. And then you go to the white suburbs, of which there are huge white suburbs, ringing, it's a classic example of white flight, it's a wealthy situation out in the suburbs where only 5% of people live in poverty. And I will tell you, I'm gonna show you this next slide, this is the impoverished city center of Detroit. It's predominantly African-American, although there are small Yemeni communities right in the middle, one called Hamtramck. This is the heart of Arab Detroit right here. It's the big suburb of Dearborn. And Iraqis have settled here and up here, just on the margins of the city um, in these, these sort of areas. You go to the lake, Lake Michigan, beautiful mansions all around here, all around here. It is a rich ring with a lot of Iraqi Chaldeans. They're Christian Iraqis who've been coming for many decades and are very wealthy, a wealthy Iraqi population, but they're Christian and they sort of disassociate themselves from the incoming Iraqi Muslim refugee population. So that is uh, the situation. This is where we're, you know, I did my study. So most of the refugees have become citizens because they came as refugees. 80% of Arab Detroiters are naturalized citizens. But look at the poverty levels. 82% of Iraqi Muslim families live on incomes, household incomes of less than 30,000 a year, which isn't that the stipend for a graduate student at Yale? OK? 30,000, OK? Whole families are living below that. Almost all, 82% of Iraqi Muslim families, almost half of Iraqi Muslim families there live on less than $10,000 a year. I don't know how anybody does that. And it's especially difficult for Arab female-headed households, almost half living below the poverty line. 
So I was there as a professor, and I, for a five-year period, I went back and forth between Ann Arbor and Arab Detroit, about a 45-minute drive. Um, I was there, I had come back from Lebanon in 2003, and it was sort of this Islamophobia was strong. Um, my colleagues in Michigan called it the ter terror dec decade. You know, we had the U.S. invasion of Iraq, all of this sort of post-911 Islamophobia, and in the midst of that, the Michigan economy and the auto industry was in a tailspin downward. The Great Recession, as you recall, happened in 2008, 2009, and by 2013, uh, Detroit had to declare Chapter 9 bankruptcy. It's the largest municipal bankruptcy in, bankruptcy in the history of the U.S. So the city, I don't know if anybody's been in the center of Detroit recently. I, I can tell you honestly, I don't have pictures, but coming back from Lebanon, which is war-torn, where there are bullet holes on buildings and collapsed buildings, if you go into the center of Detroit, it looks like a war took place there. And my young children at that time said, did a war happen here too? It's collapsing infrastructure, burned out buildings. It is just a, a scene of incredible deprivation. Um, and that is Detroit. I mean, they're trying to rebuild, but it's a very impoverished place. So I was there, I did a study, an ethnographic study. I worked with almost 100 Arab Detroiters, 55 men, 40 women, sometimes couples together, and sometimes just men alone and women alone. A lot were Iraqi refugees, they were official refugees, and they came from both of the Iraq wars, from the first Gulf War, and then the newer arrivals coming in in the second. And there were also many Lebanese, Shia, Muslim, I call them war exiles. They didn't come as official refugees, but they had fled the civil war and the 10-year Israeli occupation of southern Lebanon that lasted until the year 2000. So I was seeing this sort of incoming group of new Iraqi and Lebanese people fleeing war, as well as some Yemenis and Palestinians. The Yemenis at that time didn't have a war in their country, but they do now. I have been working on reproductive health issues my entire career, so I was focusing on reproductive health problems. But I want to say that overall, this is what in medical anthropology would call a very structurally vulnerable population. Structural vulnerability is a sort of great conceptual analytic that's been forwarded by a very well-known medical anthropologist named Philippe Bourgois and his colleagues. They work mostly with Latino immigrants in the U.S. But I think this term structural vulnerability absolutely applies to the refugee and sort of, you know, immigrant Arab population. You're, it's about your position in society. What's your financial status? Are you employed? Are you not? Do you work part time? How much do you bring home? Are you documented, undocumented? Are you a refugee, an asylum seeker? Did you complete school? Were you able to get schooling before you left your country? Do you speak English? What's your language ability? Do you have a home? Do you have shelter? Where do you live? Are you food secure? And what is your social network? Do you have people who are there for you if you need help? And then they talk about just overall environments of risk. Are you living in a place where there are gunshots, where it's safe, where there's police enforcement, where there are no toxins in the environment? Where, what is your environment in terms of overall risk? Are you profiled by police in your community? So this is sort of their notion of structural vulnerability. And I would argue that structural vulnerabilities are profound in Arab Detroit. Most of the people that I worked with were not fluent in English. Some of the men had become, often the women, women spoke no English. They were Arabic speakers only. Low levels of education, a lot of people fled before they could complete high school in Iraq or in their home countries. And when they got to Michigan, um, as you know, the, I would say in general, those who worked, those men who worked, were in what we would call blue collar or sort of uh, low wage forms of labor, like being busboys in restaurants or working in gas stations or being like a mechanic or working in a factory. And over time, with the five years I was there, I saw increasing rates of unemployment. Men were losing jobs because the auto industry was sinking. Most of the women did not work, in part because many of them didn't speak English. Um, very few people had insurance. It was uh, uninsured, you know, it was actually affordable care hadn't even happened until 2001. When did affordable, affordable care? 2009 it came, yeah. So, um, and so people were using cash. It wasn't, they didn't have credit cards, you know. 
there were sort of no social safety nets. If a catastrophe happened, you were kind of on your own. And I'd ask people, if you had an emergency, do you have family members here, or somebody who could help you? They go, our family members are in the same situation that we're in. You know, no, really no, there isn't somebody who can bail us out. So people were vulnerable. And I was especially interested in my study in the Iraqi refugee men who consistently said their lives were hard, they were under stress. Most of these men were political refugees. They were ones who'd often fought on one side or the other, mostly against Saddam Hussein. They had gone through war. Many had, had been tortured or persecuted in the ways that we heard in the first panel this morning. And so the theme was, well, I've lived through the war, Al Harb in Arabic. And they told me about what they thought they'd been exposed to. They told me about all the cancer in Iraq, about all the chemicals, about all the destruction. And I, I have a long section in my book about depleted uranium, but you know they were exposed to things there. And so ultimately, they were reproductively vulnerable men. Look at that, more than three quarters of the men in my study had serious male infertility problems. And I met them at this place called IVF Michigan, which is the largest IVF provider in all of Michigan and Ohio. They had a Dearborn office, like in the heart of Arab Detroit, where a Lebanese Shia Muslim physician would come down to try to have a sort of clinic there for the poor, the poor refugees and the sort of poor community to come. And that's where I met these people. Male infertility, just so you know, can involve many things, low sperm count, for movement of sperm, misshapen sperm, or you may not have any sperm at all in your ejaculate, or there's this thing called oligoacenosospermia, which is few sperm and they don't swim well. And so these are sort of the, you know, this is what it is, that's male infertility, and it can be very severe or not so severe. There is this technology, this m masculine hope technology called intracytoplasmic sperm injection, ICSI. It's a variant of in vitro fertilization. It was developed in 1991 in Belgium. And it is a rather revolutionary technology where if you can find any living sperm in a man's body, including by going into the testicles with needles and doing all of this needlework to try to get the sperm out, very painful. Um, <laughs> If you can find sperm, you can inject them directly into the human oocyte and remarkably cause embryos to be formed. And quite remarkably, ICSI has created now millions of offspring for men who would otherwise be absolutely infertile or sterile. So it's a rather you know, revolutionary technology, but in the US, it costs $12,500 per one cycle. And so these men, like they were trying, they were like, reproductively agentive. They were coming into the clinic. They said, well, you know, you can do what you need to to my body, you know, diagnose me, treat me. They were putting their reproductive bodies on the line. They wanted to have children. Part of rebuilding your life is to be able to have kids and to rebuild the family that was lost. And they wanted, they loved their wives, they wanted to have a family. But ICSI was absolutely unaffordable to most of these men and they, they really, it was heartbreaking. Um, in the five years that I was there, out of all the people that I worked with, only two ICSI babies were born, both to Iraqi refugee couples. That was it. And so some of the men, heartbreaking stories in my book, were about men saying, I care for my wife's feelings, she deserves to be a mother, I'm going to release her. She has the right to have children, I'm divorcing her so that she can be, be freed and go and remarry. And there were cases of that as well. So. I ended up thinking of these refugees as reproductive exiles. So it was our country, the US forced them to leave Iraq, right? They wouldn't be here if it weren't for the George, the, the George H.W. and then the George W. Bush wars, okay? The two wars by the Bush family. They are here. Most of them couldn't go back to Iraq. They're unable to return. But here they are in America in basically an inaccessible healthcare system. Can't afford US infertility services because infertility services in the US are privatized. They're seen as elective. They're not part of most uh, health insurance. There's sort of no state mandate. They're not part of the Affordable Care Act either. So if you want to treat your infertility, you have to do it out of your own pocket. And so exiled, forced out of the US reproductive health care system. ICSI was just a dream, it was a mirage for most of these people. And so in my book, I have all these stories. I have one about this guy, Ibrahim, he'd fought, he was a southern Iraqi Shia Muslim. He fought against Saddam Hussein, um, he fled, he was injured, he fled. In revenge, Saddam Hussein took his older brother, father of four children, and disappeared him. They never saw 
from him again. He felt very guilty for his brother's death, came as a refugee to the US, settled in St. Louis, Missouri, which is where they placed him, fell in love with an American woman. They were going to move into an apartment together, and the brakes on their U-Haul tractor trailer uh, didn't function, and they crashed. She was automatically killed, and he ended up spending a year in the hospital, completely broken. Um, he finally did so-called so secondary migration out of Missouri to Arab Detroit, where I met him. His family back in Iraq arranged for him to marry an Iraqi chemistry teacher, a woman from Iraq. They met in Jordan. They married. They came back to Michigan. And after all of that, he couldn't get her pregnant. So he came to IVF Michigan to figure out what was going wrong. And lo and behold, he had a severe male factor infertility problem. They told him he needed ICSI. They were going to give him a discount because the Muslim physician felt very sorry. And so out of charity, zakat, he would often do big, deep discounts. But the discount was to $10,000 from you know, 12,500. And Ibrahim said, you know, maybe if it were $5,000, maybe I could eventually earn the money or borrow the money, but $10,000, never, I'll never be able to afford this thing. And so fortunately his wife loved him. He was actually a very handsome man, I have to say. But uh, his wife, <laughs> I shouldn't say that, but it was true, he, you know. And his wife loved him and she said, look, it, it's enough that we have each other and we're out of Iraq. You know, I have you, you're enough for me. So it was sort of poignant, but at any rate, um, that was, there are many stories like this in the book. Um, so the, my book is saying, you know, Arab refugees resettled, the ones who've spent, I mean, honey, you said it takes, wasn't it you, 17 years to recreate a life? That's literally what I saw in my study in Arab Detroit. People who were still struggling, even ones who'd come from the first Gulf War, um, their health, they were living on the margins, literally, of Detroit, but also on the margins in terms of health access. And so I conclude with a lots of things. I conclude that now we've moved from Bush now jump forward to Donald Trump. And you know, in his presidential campaign, he initiated this new cycle of Islamophobia. He started calling for the Muslim ban back in 2015, 2016. And sadly, Michigan Governor Rick Snyder was one of the first ones to jump on board that thinking. He was one of more than 30 state governors who declared that they were not gonna let Syrian refugees enter their states. I say that we're in an unprecedented anti-refugee moment here that we've heard about all day long. And really, there are going to be new regimes of exclusion as long as Donald Trump remains president of the US, I'm afraid. And I want to say that Arab lives do matter, and America that caused a lot of the problems in the Arab world must care. Thank you. Answer any questions? Yes. Uh, so we can take two questions. You choose. Yeah. One here and one here. Hello. Yes. First. Mentioned the structural vulnerability of Arab refugees. Did did your research allow you to see whether that vulnerability was truly structural and passed down to their uh, to the next generation of people that had come as early refugees from? you know, prior wars, uh, did there, were their children similarly disenfranchised? Yeah, so there were generations of this going on. So the first story in my book, there's a prologue of a young Iraqi couple. They, they were actually both, um, they came as children or sort of preteens with their families in the first <coughs> Gulf War. They had lived in a Saudi refugee camp. They came and she got educated. He started working, she got educated, and they were actually doing quite well by community standards as a sort of first, you know, 0.5 refugee population, you know, sort of generation. But um, her family, they were struggling still, and the, her, her father was trying to get like a retirement, a pension out of Iraq. You know, he was not doing well, he had a small business. And so they, this is a long story, but they put everything on the line to do one, one cycle of IVF. They did it, and then a catastrophe happened. She got severe ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, ended up in the hospital with a huge hospital bill that they had no way to pay for. And she, they both said, we can't go back to our parents. Our parents are basically hardly hanging on. And so even though they were sort of beginning to like come out of poverty, they'd actually bought a small house. She had been working, you know, 
it was going well. He lost both of his jobs, you know. So they were like barely getting out and then things started going downhill and there was nobody to turn to. I mean, I asked people like, can anybody help you? And people often had nobody that they could turn to because everybody was kind of in the same situation. And this was the older generation of their parents who had come and I saw this next generation of, who had come as kids and were still just not making the American dream. There were a couple of happy stories in this book of um, a few people who did, like one guy, he worked and worked, he bought a barber shop, he taught himself how to cut hair, and then he was really good at that, and then he bought another barber shop, you know? So he had two barber shops, and uh, he was, he told me he was taking home about $30,000 in profit. Um, still, that's not a lot of money, but that was a success story for this population. And it wasn't only Iraqis, I have to tell you, the Lebanese that I saw, they were new arriving Lebanese Muslims from southern Lebanon, were equally impoverished. Um, so it, was, um, it wasn't the sort of, in the early days before 2001, the book Arab Detroit that was written, it's a huge anthology, and it was very optimistic. It was called From Margins to Mainstream about how the Arab community was doing so well and some people were opening businesses and moving out to the burbs and it was very aspirational. Then when they had to reissue it in 2011, it was called Arab Detroit, Life in the Terror Decade, you know, just about how things had sort of fallen apart for a lot of people in that community. So it's a struggling community um, over the generations and I hope that the next generation will be able to sort of move out of the situation that I describe in the book. Yeah. Uh, fan, a fantastic presentation. Uh, so uh, um, how does the Arab community view adoption? That's one quest quick question. And the larger question is, how would you compare and contrast American community in, um, in, in Dearborn and Detroit with, let's say, uh, those in the banlieues and outside Paris and Molenbeek in, in Brussels. Uh, what are some of the salient, you know, common features, but also distinctions between these populations? In the Sunni sort of dominant branch of Islam, what we call adoption, legal adoption, where you can take a child, give it your name, give it your inheritance, treat it as if it is your own biological child, is not allowed. Um, there is a system called kafala, which is fosterage or guardianship, legal guardianship, which is allowed, but you're never supposed to give a child your name. The child should always retain the name that it was, and, and know who its genealogical parents are. And because of that, adoption is a pretty hard sell throughout the Sunni Muslim world. I've written a lot about that in my my books, but, especially because I work on infertility, but having said that, in America, I saw this certain openness. People knew that there was adoption in America, and I talked to people about it, like, would you ever consider doing that to get a child? And, and some people said, you know, yeah, how do you do it? Where do you find out the information? At the end of the book, I actually say, there are going to be so many war orphan children coming out of Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan we're gonna to need to have Muslim families take in these children. And so that's one of the things I talk about at the end of the book. But adoption, um, it's, a, it's a religious uh, thorny problem, which is why people try hard to do have kids with their own biological gametes. Um, so that's one thing. The sort of, the, in the sort of areas around Paris, what we've seen in Europe, where you've got these sort of generations of disaffected youth who can then be radicalized and turned to ISIS and so forth, and we know that that's what's going on. Actually, a lot of the people who've done acts in Paris and Brussels and so forth, they're actually North Africans. They're Tunisians and Moroccans who are not coming out of Syria or Iraq. They're pe people who grew up in France and have felt like second-class marginalized citizens for a long time, and so this sort of disaffectation can really breed, you know, radicalism, if you want to put it that way. I personally did not see that in the people that I talked with. In fact, a lot of people said, I'm American. This is my country now. I have the rights of an American citizen. There was a sort of claiming of being American, um, a sort of proudness that, you know, I'm here, we struggled, and, and we're here. Um, so no, having said that, there was a lot of profiling in this community during the period that I was working there because, you know, oh, this is, you've got these Arabs, they must be fueling terrorism. And because there are a lot of Shia in this community, 
they were looking at ties between Shia Muslims in Dearborn and Hezbollah in Lebanon because it's a Shia paramilitary kind of group. And so there were people getting detained, deported. It was a rugged time last decade. So, you know, all is not well. You know. Yeah, but the high proportion of people living, you said Alice, right? And that's a really a, a road to disaffectation and, you know, discontent. And as a policy prescription, I think this is something that people should pay attention to. And, Michigan, the economy really cannot sustain this huge influx of refugees. And so I think finally, you know, that's sort of been figured out. And so people are being routed to other states. But another huge population is in um, San Bernardino. They call it the Inland Empire of California. It's a sort of very polluted part of inner Southern California. It's mostly a Latino community. And so all of these Arab Iraqi refugees have been placed in this Latino immigrant community in Southern California, we don't know how that's going to unfold, you know? So where people get placed does matter, and are there jobs in that community when people get there? I don't know really what we want to say about New Haven. New Haven's got great refugee services because of IRIS and IRAP, but it's a poor community overall, New Haven. We have to say that, and a lot of those people who've come here, the employment is maybe stable, but it's maybe not great employment. So you've got doctors working as hotel maids and that sort of thing. So we really need to think about what we do to create refugee problems, and when we bring refugees to our country, how do we take care of them? Uh, at the final, just my final political comment. A lot of Vietnamese came to this country after the Vietnam War. The boat people, there was a huge influx of something like 275,000 Vietnamese came. The U.S. gave them much more support than the U.S. has given to Iraqi refugees. They gave the Vietnamese refugee population got three years of subsidization until they could get off their off the ground. And because they were well supported as a refugee population, um, Vietnamese have done very well in America. They, are, they have higher rates of college attendance than sort of the general American public. There's something like modal income, household income for the Vietnamese population is something like $55,000. Vietnamese have been kind of a model minority group because the U.S. gave a lot of initial support. And there's been real critique of the Iraqi refugee influx they didn't get near that amount of support from the U.S. government. We've really kind of failed, in some ways, the overall Iraqi community. We failed them because we invaded the country, and we've sort of failed Iraqis as a nation when they get here. So that's my pol those are my politics. Thank you very much. Thank you.